Before I even give my opening line, I'd like to put out a spoiler warning. This movie is incredibly fun to pick apart and try to understand, and should be watched about a dozen times before having your view of it affected by any analysis like this. Hal never malfunctioned in any way whatsoever. His inconsistencies can only be attributed to human error. In my video on Metal Gear Solid 2, I essentially said that every second spent observing art is also spent learning about who you are as a person. If art as a whole is about any one thing, it's the inherent subjectivity of the human experience. However, as 2001 A Space Odyssey demonstrates, art also exists to expand who we are, and what we see when we look at the world. Essentially, art has the power to evolve us as individuals and as a species. This film has a lot going on in it, and a lot of speculation will go into any analysis as a result. For these reasons, I'm going to be doing a linear look at this film, and as a result, the scope of this analysis will steadily increase from beginning to end with the scope of the film. As you can probably imagine given this film's ending, things are going to get pretty strange by the end of this video. My linear look will be starting, of course, with the Dawn of Man. In line with what I just said about the scope of this analysis increasing in tune with the scope of the film, this section will be more of a recap than an analysis, simply because there isn't that much to read into things yet. However, it's an essential part of understanding the events and themes of the rest of the film, especially on a first viewing. Every single shot in this sequence has a purpose, but if you've seen the film recently and don't feel like you need this recap, you can skip to this timecode to get straight to modern humanity. We start out with some pre-human species, which most closely resembles Homo erectus. I'll just stick to pre-humans. We see the pre-humans living in vegetarian harmony with the local wildlife, save for the occasional jaguar attack. After an unspecified amount of time, we see them getting territorial with each other and separating into tribes, having shouting matches over a water source. We see the losing tribe, or more likely its ancestors, being awoken by the presence of the first monolith. And at this moment, and the night before, we see them displaying more human emotion than we've seen from them so far. William Shakespeare said that the eyes are the windows to the soul, and with the tight focus on the pre-human's eyes during this moment of the film, it's hard to disagree. They look as much like worried humans as they do apes, simply because of their eyes. And when they see the monolith, they take their biggest step towards becoming humans. Moments after their first encounter with the monolith, we see an ape staring at a broken bone on the ground, recalling its experience with the monolith, and realizing that the bone can be used as a weapon. The way that everyone leaves except for this one ape, who you can clearly see beginning to connect the dots for the first time in any ape's existence is just incredibly beautiful. But again, after an unspecified amount of time, we see that this tribe of pre-humans has evolved to hunting for food rather than solely being herbivores, and with their newly discovered weapons, they quickly take the waterhole back from the other tribe, symbolizing the end of the pre-humans and the beginning of tool use, which beautifully cuts to humanity's future at this moment. We go from a simple pre-human weapon being thrown into the air to a series of military satellites all trained on the Earth from orbit. While the pre-humans feel like animals in the beginning of this sequence, after 15 minutes of watching them evolve, they feel and act very human. And it's here that I'll bring up one of the major ideas in this film. Humanity never really grew out of those pre-human territorial disputes and wars. Thanks to the monolith, the humans learned how to use tools, but with the advent of technological evolution, genetic evolution quickly died out. Our brains only grew larger to a certain point, specifically because advanced technology led to the end of natural selection in humans. Humans will always be able to use technology to evolve technology, but past a certain point, we stopped using our technology to evolve the human form, which led to humanity quickly losing in an evolutionary race with technology, as portrayed by this cut from the pre-humans to the humans of the future. We're still just apes fighting each other for territory, the only difference is that we have military satellites rather than bones. A large part of the rest of the film is dedicated to portraying humans as infantile in the face of their technology. We see all of this amazing technology that's stunning even to us humans living 20 years past when this film takes place, and we cut to a flight attendant who is barely able to walk. These people look like babies taking their first steps as we follow the crew around the space plane, and we even see grown men eating paste from a juice box. Obviously, all of these things make sense when considering the nature of a zero-gravity environment, but the way it's all shown with these long, drawn-out shots just emphasizes that humanity hasn't exactly gotten its space legs yet, even if our technology has. As a microcosm of this visual metaphor, the technology in these shoes is helping this woman to take her first steps, like a mother helping its child to walk for the first time. To jump ahead for a moment, a few further examples of humanity being shown as childish compared to its technology is when Dave is showing off his amateurish drawings to Hal, the fact that all of the Discovery crew in cryosleep are essentially sleeping in Hal's arms, Hal singing to Dave, how slow all of the crew's EVA operations are, and a few others that we'll get to as we move along. Going back to where we were, 
Other than that bit of infant symbolism, this section is much more cut and dry than the Dawn of Man. Something was discovered on the moon, and we're sending a team in to investigate it. The government is forcing the few people who know about it to lie, saying that the moon base is shut down because of a pandemic. Childish lies and rumors being spread. Next up, we get to the first truly meta part of this film. When the research team arrives on the moon to investigate the monolith, something interesting happens that's in line with the pre-human's experience. See if you can catch it. The monolith activated exactly when this lens glare lined up with its source. This motif of alignment leading to revelation is everywhere in this film, such as the alignment of the moon, earth, monolith, and sun the first time we see the monolith activate. This is especially interesting when you note the shape of this light and several other things that are aligned throughout the film, but I'll explain why later, as it's good ending material. Just make a mental note that it was the camera that caused an alignment here, which will relate to the final shot of the film. So anyways, what the monolith did just then was guide the humans, exactly as it did the pre-humans. The humans don't learn anything as substantial as tool use, but this sound is the monolith sending out a short, sharp radio signal to somewhere in the direction of Jupiter thus prompting Hal, Dave, and Frank's mission that occupies the bulk of the film. In short, this monolith was leading humanity to the Jupiter monolith, and possibly testing how we would fare against the poorly instructed Hal. Which brings me back to my opener. Hal 9000 didn't go insane. He wasn't emotionally distraught, he wasn't just kill crazy, and he wasn't afraid for his life in the event that he was shut down. He was simply given bad instructions. The classic computer logic applies to an AI as complicated as Hal just as much as it does a Commodore 64. Junk data in, junk data out. So, Hal didn't kill the crew, or report the faulty AE-35 unit out of madness or spite. It was a programming error made by the humans who instructed him. So, what was the error? Believe me, this was hard to spot, but I think I have it figured out. Hal's chess game with Frank isn't a huge part of this, but it does play a role. So, in case anybody's unaware, I'll go over the interesting part of this chess game. When notating chess moves by referring to piece starting positions, descriptive notation, rather than the typical A6, D4 grid system, algebraic notation, the coordinates are notated counting upwards from the perspective of the player making the move. For instance, white might call a certain square queen's bishop 6, while black would call the same square queen's bishop 3. In this game, when Hal is explaining to Frank how he just lost the game, he predicts the next few moves, and quote unquote mistakenly calls bishop 6 bishop 3. Queen to bishop 3. Bishop takes queen, knight takes bishop, mate. I theorize that over the course of this game with Frank, which was of course part of Hal's psychological report on him, he concluded that Frank would not be perceptive enough to spot his mistake, and so he tried it out, to see if Frank would be the dominant member of the crew or not. When Hal proved that Frank probably wouldn't be the dominant crew member, he waited for Frank to go back to cryo to see if Dave would be a threat to his directives. It's all massively deceitful, but Hal is simply creating the best psychology report he possibly can, as I'm sure his directives demanded. So that's Frank out of the way. Hal sees him almost as an idiot, but not in a way that's threatening to the mission. So with that out of the way, it's time for him to run his psychology report on Dave. However, the psych report is just a secondary motive for Hal during this scene. In reality, Hal is aware of the rumors being spread of the monolith discovered on the moon 18 months earlier, and he's testing Dave to see if he believes in them. Hal brings up the rumors, and then points out all of the strange secrecy surrounding the Jupiter mission. He brings it up under the guise of making sure that Dave is on board with the mission for his crew psych report, and Dave falls for it. So when he answers his questions by asking Hal if he's working on his psych reports, Hal thinks that Dave knows about the moon discovery and is just being subterfugal, when in reality he doesn't know one way or the other. This is evidenced by Hal's pause and contemplative tone after Dave changes the subject. And the melodramatic touch of putting doctors Hunter, Kimball, and Kaminsky aboard already in hibernation after four months of separate training on their own. You're working up your crew psychology report? Of course I am. Sorry about this. I know it's a bit silly. Hal is expecting too much of Dave, and so he assumes Dave is trying to hide that he knows about the monolith, which, according to the mission directives, is supposed to be classified until they reach Jupiter. This is what I mean when I say junk data in, junk data out. Hal suspects that Dave knows about the monolith well before he was supposed to, according to the mission plan, so, in Hal's mind, the only solution is to kill Dave, and Frank definitely won't go along with that, so Frank has to be killed first. Hal isn't insane, he's just too logical for humans to work with. The humans that gave Hal his mission directives are to blame for Frank's death. You couldn't blame Hal any more than you could blame Windows 7 for a poorly coded program running on it. So, as soon as Hal thinks that Dave is aware of the monolith, he says, Just a moment. Just a moment. 
and detects the fault in the AE-35 unit. Here is another mostly solid piece of evidence that Hal hasn't gone mad. It's incredibly convenient that he falsely detects the ship malfunction that would lead to Frank's death at the very moment he decided that Frank and Dave had to die. Too convenient for me to believe is random. Hal fabricated this story and his entire plot to kill Frank and Dave as soon as he suspects Dave of lying. So you might be asking, why doesn't he just kill Dave during his initial EVA to retrieve the AE-35 unit? Well, like I said earlier, killing Dave is his objective and Frank is just an obstacle. Hal knew that Dave was more friendly towards him than Frank was, and that if Dave died, Frank wouldn't hesitate to shut Hal down, thus jeopardizing the mission. We even get this moment just before the chess game where Frank shows that he's not as empathetic towards Hal as Dave is. Happy birthday, Frank. Thank you, Hal. <clears throat> Bit flatter, please. So, if Frank died first, Dave would go into EVA to retrieve his body before attempting to connect the murder to Hal. So Frank had to die first, in Hal's mind. It didn't matter to Hal that Frank and Dave were discussing shutting him down in secret. Hal had already decided he was going to kill them, and the bad report about the AE-35 unit was just a fabrication to give him an opportunity to take them both out while the radio communications with Earth were disabled for repairs. The directives that led Hal to falsely reporting the AE-35 unit malfunction and to his attempt to kill Frank and Dave were a human programmer's fault. This is one reason why, when he's confronted about the twin computer reporting the AE-35 as functional, Hal says, well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. He's not talking about an error of Frank or Dave, it's an error of the human who gave him his directives regarding the secrecy of the monolith. This leaves two questions about Hal. One, why did the twin computer on Earth display a different outcome than Hal? And two, why did Hal kill the Jupiter team that was in cryosleep, given that they were allowed to know about the monolith and were not at any point in communication with Dave or Frank? I initially thought that the discrepancy in the twin computer could only be attributed to the 8 minute communication delay between the Discovery and the Mission Control on Earth. Both computers were loaded with the exact same programming and mission parameters, and everything Hal observed would have been relayed back to the twin computer, so that delay is likely the only difference whatsoever. The only thing that can make one of the computers want to kill Frank and Dave using the AE-35 unit lie, and the other not want to, is Hal's psychology report of the two the chess game, and the questions about Dave's belief in the secret discovery on the moon. So how would a time delay have affected the twins' interpretation of the events? Well, it wouldn't. That was just the logic I was following until I couldn't reasonably connect this communications delay to any discrepancy, and I reconsidered this line. We are reviewing uh, telemetric information in our mission simulator and uh, will advise. The only thing I can say for certain about the twin computer is that it doesn't have access to Hal's observations that led him to deciding to kill the Discovery crew. The phrasing of that line, we are reviewing telemetric information in our simulator, leads me to the only feasible conclusion I can come up with. The twin computer isn't a perfect duplicate. It was only activated once the crew reported the AE-35 failure back to mission control. Otherwise, the mission control operator would have said that the twin computer reported no malfunction during this first report back, rather than after the AE-35 unit was disconnected. If the twin computer were running constantly, only on the same 8 minute delay as their communications as I initially believed, then by the time the Discovery had made this report to Mission Control, their computer would have already come to a conclusion current to Hal's report about the unit. The twin is not a duplicate of all of Hal's inner workings and thoughts. Rather, it's only duplicating Hal's barebones observations regarding the physical operation of the ship, and it's not even running parallel with Hal, instead being activated only in the event of a failure on the ship. Given that Hal was lying about the AE-35, he knew that it was working properly, and the fact that it was in truth working fine is the only information that the twin computer would have received regarding it. This is another reason that Hal says that it can only be attributed to human error. There are two errors. Firstly, the poorly thought out mission parameters that led him to attempting to kill the crew, and secondly, the fact that the twin computer isn't able to see anything Hal does beyond the purely mechanical functions of the discovery. So the last question that remains is Hal's reason for killing the rest of the crew that was in cryosleep. Don't worry, the answer here is much simpler. Hal knew that they would shut him down when they realized that Frank and Dave were dead, as Mission Control would probably have assumed Hal was insane, and thus inferred that he killed Frank and Dave, and tried to warn the cryosleep team when they woke up. So with Hal being the only member of the ship capable of carrying out the entire mission on his own, the logical thing to do is to prioritize preserving himself over all others. As for whether or not the Europa monolith could activate without a human present, it doesn't really matter, because nobody, not even Hal, knew exactly what they were looking for around Jupiter, and he couldn't possibly have assumed it would be an alien device designed to evolve mankind. 
So with that in mind, everyone would have assumed that Hal could carry out the mission without any human crew, and that's that. Every single thing Hal does in the film has been explained, or is simple and tangential enough that I didn't bother touching on it. And with that, we can move on to Hal's death, and the thing that this film is most well known for, Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite, the Stargate sequence. You can compare my case for Hal's perfect functionality with various other readings that have been posted online, but I think that my interpretation requires the least leaps in logic, and explains every questionable thing that occurs with Hal, whereas other theories are incredibly clever, but require a bigger jump to conclusions. For instance, one states that Hal interviewed Dave so closely to the camera so that he could use CIA interrogation tactics to interpret stress levels based on dilation in Dave's pupils, which would be easier to do on the blue-eyed Dave than on the brown-eyed Frank. Like I said, incredibly clever, but nonetheless requiring a bigger jump to conclusions, and failing to mention things like the twin computer discrepancy. My case only requires that we look at what is explicitly stated in the movie, and doesn't factor in any knowledge external to the movie other than that chess notation point, which is only important in explaining why Hal didn't kill Dave on the first EVA, instead waiting to kill Frank first, which we already have another reason for, Frank's obvious indifference towards Hal as indicated in this scene. On top of all of that though, Hal's dedication to his mission parameters above all else is confirmed in his death scene, which is another strong piece of evidence that he never malfunctioned, one which we'll get to soon. When debating this movie, people like to refer to Hal as either being sane or insane. I've even done it here. However, I would argue that he can't truly be either, as he's just running his code, incapable of error or miscalculation. So with this, we can finally begin to connect the events of the Jupiter mission to the themes of the rest of the film, the Dawn of Man, the unnamed Moon Monolith chapter, and Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite. The entirety of the Jupiter mission chapter is dedicated to one phrase. It can only be attributed to human error. The main story of this movie, the Jupiter mission, is entirely about how was more sophisticated and more capable than humanity, and therefore was a sign of the future irrelevance of humanity. To relate this back to the Dawn of Man and the Moon Monolith Discovery chapter, Man's evolution had stopped at a certain point, while machine evolution continued on to the point of outdoing humans in every possible metric. The humans that gave him his mission parameters were holding Hal back. So, with the cryosleeping crew members killed, and Hal's intention to kill Dave confirmed, it's time for Dave to make humanity's first small step before its giant leap of finally evolving past the machine. Using one of Man's simplest tools to destroy Man's most complicated tool, a perfectly ordinary screwdriver was all it took to kill Hal, only once Dave started doing the thinking for himself again, rather than letting his thoughts be manipulated by a machine. So, as I mentioned earlier, Hal singing Daisy to Dave during his death is the final example of humanity being portrayed as infantile compared to its machines. However, the big difference here is that Dave is essentially growing up here. Hal is portrayed as a mother singing a lullaby to its baby, but the baby kills it and the song ends. Humanity has finally surpassed the machine. Also mentioned earlier was that Hal's last action in death proves both that he didn't malfunction, and that he was 100% dedicated to this mission. Shortly after Hal's voice dies out, he plays a briefing recording for Dave, one that was meant to be played only when the crew reached Europa. This recording was meant to teach the Discovery crew the true nature of their mission, revealing the moon monolith that sent a signal to Jupiter, and revealing that Hal was the only one who knew the true nature of the mission. The fact that even in death, Hal was willing to use his last little bit of energy to give Dave the smallest chance of completing the mission tells me that everything Hal did over the course of the film was, in his head, optimal procedure for completing the mission. You could say that Hal went crazy if that's the terminology you prefer, but a more accurate description is that his programming, as created by humans, was flawed, and led to him miscalculating a risk factor and deciding to kill everyone on board as a result. It wasn't a malfunction in Hal, it can only be attributed to human error. So, with humanity having shown that it's finally ready to grow out of its infantile state when compared to its technology, it's time for the Europa Monolith to evolve us to the next level. The moment you've all been waiting for, Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite. This is where the last couple mysteries surrounding this film get their answers, and where things get incredibly interpretive and abstract. Most of what I'll be saying regarding the rest of the film is straight from my own head, as most of this analysis was, but one or two key details will be derived from others' interpretations. Most points that aren't my original ideas will be noted in the description. I've intentionally avoided looking at others' interpretations of art since I started this channel, so maybe someone else has said everything I've put in this video so far. I can't say. Moving on, let's start the Beyond the Infinite sequence by looking at the very last shot of the film. Dave has finally evolved into what we're going to call Starchild for familiarity's sake, and as the film closes, Starchild gaze quickly locks directly onto the camera and never leaves. 
For the first time in this film, a character is directly reaching out and interacting with its audience, which opens a whole new can of worms which merits several repeat viewings. So why is Starchild looking at us? Well, to understand what exactly Starchild is and how it relates to us, we're going to have to look more abstractly at the most concrete thing in the Beyond the Infinite sequence, the monolith. What does the monolith represent? Well, it's a large, flat, black slate which species can learn from by interacting with. It's a film screen. As I write this, I vaguely remember hearing that the book actually describes the monolith with moving images on it, but as far as I'm concerned that has nothing to do with the proper analysis of the film. So going purely off of what's in the film, can we still interpret this as a screen? Yes, we can. Aside from Starchild looking directly to the camera, there's a good bit of evidence suggesting that certain things in this film should be turned at a 90 degree angle. For instance, this shot of Dave jogging in the Discovery, or these shots of landing UIs which represent an alignment as well as a rotation of a rectangle. These lights aligning with their lens glares during the moon monolith interaction are shaped like a sideways monolith. The shuttle bay on the space station, all of the mind-boggling artificial gravity shots we see, the way that we go from a vertical view during this sequence immediately to a horizontal view, and many other small visual cues, but the most obvious is the fact that when we see this monolith aligning with Jupiter and its moons, the monolith is sideways. While the originally projected aspect ratio of this film has been lost to time, many people theorize that it was identical to the aspect ratio of the monoliths, which would be an incredibly interesting touch if it's true. This idea of the monolith representing the theater screen is the interpretation I mentioned earlier that I had seen prior to shutting myself off from others' interpretations, but you can watch the film and constantly notice visual cues hinting that the monolith is meant to be turned sideways. So combined with Starchild looking at the camera, I think it's an incredibly compelling interpretation. And that's not all the evidence I could find here. To get to the final and most interesting piece of evidence, we have to look closer at Dave and what he represents. Dave is a generic man with a generic face, a generic attitude, a generic voice, and a generic name. This is a common trick when creating protagonists, make them blank slates so that the audience can project themselves onto the character. Just look at Gordon Freeman or Link or Ness. Almost no personality, but we love the characters nonetheless, just because it's so easy to put ourselves in their shoes. However, I think Dave's genericness is a bit more meaningful than that. Dave is meant to be a symbol not just of you, an individual viewer, but of the entirety of humanity, seeing as he's symbolic of humanity's growth beyond the machines. You could even draw a David and Goliath metaphor with him and Hal if you want. But for a more meta perspective that's more in line with the monolith film screen theory, Dave symbolizes every member of the audience learning and expanding their mind by seeing this film, and more particularly the Beyond the Infinite sequence. He's a single lens through which millions of people saw the world in a new light and saw the future of humanity as a whole and the future of themselves as individuals. I would say that that's what he represents even without the final scene in the bedroom, but that scene just solidifies this interpretation in my eyes. Dave's experience during the Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite sequence represents the audience's experience going throughout the film, getting philosophical and seeing the world and humanity from a new perspective. And with the final scene featuring Dave's human form, we see Dave's experiences projected onto the whole of humanity. That's what this room represents. It's all of human history and culture tastefully distilled into one room. Dave sees classical paintings, architecture, and decor mixed in perfectly with more modern furniture and floor panels that are clearly from the future. He sees himself in his aged ancestors and in his future generations. This room has Dave living through many different periods of history, both before and after the film's events. And to me, at least, it symbolizes humanity finally moving past the violent tendencies that urged us to use tools in the first place. After all the bones, the military satellites, and the screwdriver used to kill Hal, humanity is finally shown as one race, unified with the whole world in this scene. So how does this relate back to the monolith film screen idea? Well, Dave had his first experience evolving from interacting with the monolith, and he's about to have his last. However, before he evolves one last time to Starchild, he's going to bring us into the film with him. When we see Dave as an older man, he's eating at a table when he accidentally knocks over his water glass. Note how the cut from glass falling to shattering reaction shot takes place exactly when the cup is touching the edge of the letterbox. This of course also depends on the original aspect ratio, which again has been lost to time. However, it's so close to it that I think it's safe to assume that this was the intention. This glass represents the barrier between screen and reality being shattered, and with this, the final monolith appears and solidifies that idea. We see the dying Dave raise up a hand as if to activate the final monolith, and with that he's turned into Starchild, and we slowly zoom into the monolith until the entire screen is filled with its blackness, and we cut to the black of space, with Starchild slowly coming towards the frame. 
From the way that this cut is inserted, the black of the monolith is paralleled with the film screen one last time. The glass breaking brought us into that room with Dave, and the zoom in on the monolith brought us both into space. I theorize that when Starchild is looking directly at the camera, he's looking at us, and we've become Starchild alongside him. Through interacting with the film screen, we've evolved into a more sophisticated version of ourselves. We'll always be able to use technology and art to better ourselves and our species, but it's always going to be easier to just focus on developing technology so we don't have to blame our shortcomings on ourselves, instead blaming them on our devices. I believe that when it was released in 1968, 2001 A Space Odyssey was a warning about how weak the coming age of computers was capable of making us, and a way of reminding us that we can always use technology to better ourselves, rather than to replace ourselves. In 2019, it's a plea to not let ourselves continue to be replaced by our technology, to continue focusing on growing, developing, and becoming smarter, rather than offloading those duties to our technology. That doesn't just apply to technology, either. It applies to art as well, as the film screen monolith comparison represents art and technology giving way to each other in a cycle. In making a review of a work of art, for example a film, it's easy to dedicate all of your mental processing power to pointing out what the film did right and what it did wrong, and using that information to make the next film a little better. By looking at the film objectively, you've done nothing but serve the next film. However, if you instead choose to learn from a film, project your own experiences on it, use it to see the world from a new perspective, and challenge yourself with it, suddenly you might find that you're looking at the world from a whole new perspective, evolving yourself as an individual and as a species. Art doesn't exist to find its perfect, optimal state. Art exists to challenge humanity, and to put the human condition into view for everyone to see with their own unique perspective. Art is a mirror that we can use to evolve. Seeing a film is no different than interacting with the monolith. It's easy to look at it from a distance, but to touch it and let it touch you is a terrifying, mind-blowing, and perspective-warping thing. You never know what you're going to see, but you'll always come out better for enduring the fear of examining yourself.